All right, so going over this again, let's see. You've got your airport name, the approach on which, or er, for this, sorry, the approach that uh, this chart's for. So the ILS localizer runway six, right? These are all the frequencies. Um, the only one is a dispatcher that you'll ever really use if you need to would be this digital latest, the D8 is here, um, because that's the weather. So if there's like something missing in your weather report in the METAR, you can call the digital latest and see if they've got it on there. And uh, you just call into this, uh, oh, shoot. Let's make a call real quick so you guys can hear it. Okay, here you go. Salt Lake Airport HS information X ray zero zero five four Zulu. Wind three three zero at liner. Visibility one zero. Two clouds at one zero south on two clouds at two zero south on temperature two six two point minus one. Altimeter three zero zero eight. Parallel ILS runway three four left. Runway 34 right, LDA DMB runway 35, for visual approach in the news. Notices two airmen. Taxiway Alpha close between Taxiway Alpha 3 and Taxiway Alpha 5, Taxiway Alpha 4 close, restricted area 64, 12 Alpha and Charlie active below 8000. Caution for extensive burn activity in the vicinity of the airport. Advise on initial contact. You have information x-ray. There you go. So that was Salt Lake City ATIS. Um, whole bunch of information that they spew out there, huh? Do they speak English? <laughs> no, they speak robot. There's a couple stations, though, that do have somebody actually read the report. Um, I mean... It's not live, it's a recorded thing, but yeah, they, some of them don't sound too bad. That one does. That one's really bad. But. I think they could use Siri or somebody. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um. Okay, so this frequency here, once again, this is the nav aid on which this approach is predicated. So this is the ILS GPE for GPE here. So this is the signal. You can see this arrow here. That's the, the ILS um, approach. So... Um, it's kind of the, the tractor beam, if you will, pulling the uh, airplanes down into, into safe landing. So, um, yeah, you got the final approach course, the glide slope. So you pick it up over Guppy at 18,000 feet or 1800 feet. Um, your ILS decision altitude or decision height is 200 feet. Airport elevation is right here. And then this box here is the MSA. Who can, who, who remembers what the MSA is? Anybody? Minimum sector altitude. 
Great. So what is, what is it? How do how would we read that? That your lowest altitude between zero one zero degrees and two four zero degrees is twenty seven hundred feet. So it's the lowest ops or lowest altitude in which we can fly and clear all obstacles by a thousand feet. So yeah, don't want to get any lower than twenty seven hundred feet when you're within the twenty nautical miles of the airport uh, in that sector. That's it. If there was absolutely no visuals, you're completely blind, and you're just trying to navigate through the area, really. So um, here you can see the missed approach fix. So this is talking about Amatra. or Amtra, I'm trying to find it on here. Can't see that. Um, Yeah. Anyway, so this is our missed approach procedure here. Climb to 600 feet, then climbing left turn to 3,000 feet, outbound on the LAX, VOR radial 0462, AMTRA, INT, DME 17.3, LAX, and hold. So LAX and hold means contact air traffic control uh, once you're in that holding pattern there. And they'll vector you back into the airport. Um, this also has a couple other little notes. Simultaneous approach authorized. Um, let's see. So who remembers what this black arrow is? Highest elevation. The highest elevation. Yep. So that just points to the highest elevation in the, in that picture there. Perfect. Okay, you can see here, what are what are these little markings here? That one's gray, but then you see another one right here. You see another one right there. What are, what are those? Can you indicate them again? Sorry, I missed it. You're fine. The uh, D19.6 here. This one's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Kind of blew that one. Right here, you see another one, D18.8. Um, D10.8. What is that D indicating? That the high, the high highways? So the D is the D, uh, DME, so the distance from those stations. So you can see here the distance from the station up here, FIM. So you can see that FIM up in this corner, right? Let me see. So that... Uh, So that's the VOR. It's not on the map. It's probably somewhere right here on the map. Anyways, from here to here 
it's DME 19.6. So if you tune into the distance measuring equipment, tune into this VOR and watch it. When you get to here, it will be on the 161 radial and you'll um, Um, you can also see this Santa Monica, you can see off the 259 radial, you can see this uh, DME 18.8. .8. So you've got the Santa Monica and the FIM VOR that are identifying this intersection here. Um, let's see. You can also see the distances between each of the intersections and VORs on top here. 19.6, 18.5, I mean 8.5, 3.0. This one you see a 4.9, 5.1 etc. That's the distance from this point to this point would be that 8.5. So um, yeah. Let's see. Once again, these are the, the different frequencies. So when you are looking at this approach and you're trying to determine whether or not you can shoot this approach, um, you need to make sure that all of those stations, the main stations, the VORs that are identified here, are working. Because if not, then, you know, we don't have the necessary information we need um, to identify those different waypoints. Does that make sense? So that 259 gray, gray line there that says uh, <clears throat> D18.8 is coming off the Santa Monica VOR at 259 degrees, and it's 18.8 .8 miles from the Santa Monica VOR exactly. to that Walker, whatever that is. Yep, Walker intersection. So Walker intersection is identified 18.8 .8 off the 259 radial of Santa Monica. You can also see here this IAF. IAF stands for Initial Approach Fix. So it's really important that they pick this up because this is the start of their entire approach, that final approach into the airport, you know. So super important that they identify that. So that's why you have to have Santa Monica um, working. And then that's why you also have to have, you know, this uh, FIM working is because those are providing a point. Uh, basically, it, those are what point to those intersections. So you can also see up here in this Missed approach procedure. Oops, didn't go quite high enough. You can see here in this missed approach peak, uh, procedure that it's identifying the LAX VOR. We have to, that's, I mean, if, um, if it identifies a VOR in the missed approach uh, procedure, then we either have to have what's called a, a published missed approach um, for that airport, 
or that VOR has to be working. If it's not working, we have to have the published missed approach uh, procedure in the NOTAMs. So, um, and, and we'll get to the NOTAMs and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but. Um, let's see here. Okay. Just the last couple things and then we'll start talking about minimums here. But, um, so this is the profile view. Um, and remember this Maltese cross is the final approach fix. So this is where we start that final descent down into the runway. Um, oh, something that I saw in here that I didn't tell you guys about. Here's your lines of longitude and latitude. So that can help you identify where that airport is located. But anyways, um, this is telling you the DME between each one of the stations. Uh, or each one of these intersections here. So you can see this one's six miles from Oats to Guppy, and then from Guppy to the localizer here, um, it's gonna be 4.2. Well, I guess to the missed approach, and then from the missed approach to the GPE um, localizer is 0.6, and then you're in. So. Yeah, here's your conversion uh, for ground speeds in knots. So, um, that can help you a little bit, I guess, um, if you're trying to determine distance and need a quick conversion chart. Um, yeah. Once again, this is a graphical version of the uh, missed approach procedure. A little bit easier to read when it's in pictures, you know. Um, okay. So let's talk about um, approach minimum or landing minimums. So when we talk about landing minimums, and this, I want you guys to take really good notes here because this is gonna be super important. So when we talk about landing minimums, we're talking about minimums at the destination airport. So this is the airport that we intend to land at. Um, and it's listed as the destination on our release. How, do we determine what those minimums are? Isn't it the type of aircraft and the weight and all that? So, and then there's. So it's not necessarily the weight, but yeah, the speed that it uh, that it typically approaches the uh, the airport. So, um, you know, and we went over the speeds last class, but yeah, exactly. It's it's by category. So the CRJ seven hundred is a class C because it approaches. I want to say it was like one twenty to one forty or one fifty. Um, for the speed. So since its speed is in that C range, that's the minimums we use. So that being said, what would our minimums be? For a C? Sir, yeah, for a full ILS. What is that? It's a category one? 2,400 and a half a mile. So, so category C, we start over on this side of the chart. But yeah, so 
This 2400 is our RVR. So RVR is always controlling, right? It stands for runway visual range. So if the METAR is below the one mile or whatever, they typically start showing this RVR conversion. Um, and so that's when you'll see that. Typically they don't show it unless you're down to like low ceilings or low visibility. Then they'll start publishing the RVR in your weather report. But for this class or whenever you're asked what are the landing minimums for this chart, you're always going to look here first at the decision height, 200 feet, and then here at the miles visibility, so 200 and one half. And this is something super important that you guys need to write down and, and really remember and try to retain um, before flight planning, but um, when we're selecting a runway or an approach to um, derive our landing minimums off of, the approach chart that's always going to give us our lowest minimums is going to be an ILS, okay? This ILS here. ILS or localizer, really. I mean, it's going to be ILS localizer. So that's what we're looking for every time when we're looking for landing minimums and we're trying to figure out are we legal to land we're always going to look for a localizer and if they have a localizer approach we're going to make sure that it's not notumed out and notum means that um you know well it means notice to airmen but basically it identifies problems at the airport right or at different stations um so if it's notumed out means that there's a notum in there that says, you know, um, the GPE VOR localizer or whatever is out of service. At that point, this all of a sudden, you can't get landing minimums off of it if it's not legal. Um, but then, oops. Um, what is the wording that you want us to have for this? <laughs> Good question. Um, no, just what I want you guys to write down is that the ILS approach will always have the lowest landing minimums. Can we take a, a quick uh, five or ten minute break here? Sorry, I know we're in the heat of battle here, but. I'm good with ten. All right. Let's meet back on here at uh, seven or eight o'clock, eight o'clock straight up. Okay. Everybody back. <clears throat> okay, so uh, everybody get the ILS being the lowest possible minimums. Um, and you guys remember why an ILS would be the lowest minimums. We have two different types of approaches. Who can... Who remembers that first? I'm hoping I get, uh, there is precision and non-precision approaches. Exactly, and what, what's the difference between the two? Precision is vertical. Horizontal navigation, ILS, 
R nav GPS PAR. Uh, non precision is horizontal nav. And then it's got LOC, VOR, GPS, NBD. Okay, mm -hmm. so an ILS is what type of approach? Precision. Precision. So it's providing both that lateral and, and uh, vertical guidance. So that being said, it's also using ground-based, so only ground-based. So navigational, there's a little bit bigger of a cushion. Navigation's more precise, but there's a bigger cushion required um, by the FAA. ILS is dialed in. Uh, very reliable. It's like the uh, landline telephones, you know, versus cell phones. Cell phones are more effective and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, old reliable just keeps going and going and going. Um, and that's our ILS. So... Um, That being said, the um, ILS minimums are always going to be the lowest possible approach. So the first thing I do when I'm flight planning is I'll go in and let's see, I'll like scroll down and you can see we've got Let's get to the approach plates. Okay, so here's the approach plates. You've got ILS here. You've got ILS here. ILS here. ILS. And ILS. ILS. So Los Angeles has a lot of ILSs. Um, oh, and those are the only charts that we pulled for you guys. But anyways, let's see. Salt Lake, I know. Actually, let's do Las Vegas. I'm pretty sure we pulled this up. First thing I'll do when I'm trying to find landing minimums or alternate minimums is I will go find the ILS charts because I know those are going to give me the best. If we continue to scroll, look, we've got a VOR here, but a VOR is a non-precision approach. Um, so let's look at the minimums of a VOR approach here, of this VOR approach. We've got, if everybody can see, we've got 651, which translates into what? What do we do with that number? Have to round it round up. up. Yep, round it up to the next hundred. So we've got 700 feet, one and three quarter mile for our our landing minimums. Now let's look at an ILS approach. So sometimes these approaches are even to the same runways. So this VOR approach is to runway 25 left or right. And look, we've got an ILS to 25 right here. And look at our minimums now compared to the VOR minimums. It's quite a big difference, isn't it? We got a lot tighter, better tolerances for ILS than any other approach. That being said, not every single airport will have an ILS, though. Some of these outlying stations just won't have it. But let's go back in here to L.A. Okay. Now... 
you guys are, are comfortable with uh, destination or also known as landing minimums, correct? Let's go to a different one. Uh, so we've got our landing minimums here. And you guys can spot them, right? 200, one half. That's how we will read it every time. We won't read the RVR unless they say, what's the RVR? Then we'll read the RVR. But whenever we're reading landing minimums, we always read the visibility and ceiling like this, 200 and a half. So ceilings first, visibility second. Okay. And then you can see as, you know, let's say the ALS goes out, um, but we still have the ILS. So ALS, once again, stands for Approach Light System. So let's say the Approach Light System goes out, but we still have the full ILS. Our landing minimums will be 200 and 3 quarters. Okay. Now let's say that the glide slope goes out. Okay. GS stands for glide slope. You'll also see it abbreviated G P. Let's make that a little bit better there. So GP. GP stands for glide path, glide slope. They're one and the same, but in NOTAMs, for some reason, most NOTAMs, you'll see it written as GP and not GS. So just remember that GP and GS are the same exact thing, okay? Um, okay, so if our glide slope goes out, our minimums now go to what? 405 eighths. Yep, 405 eighths, okay. Good, we round that up. Five eighths, good. Now let's say the, say the glide slope is out and also the ALS is out. Now what is it? Four hundred and one and a quarter. So four hundred, isn't it? Oh. Nope, four hundred, one and a quarter. So the ceilings, regardless of what section we're looking at, the ceilings that are published at the top will always be the ceiling we use. So for anything that's in these, in between these two lines, we'll always use this ceiling, okay? Anything between these two lines, we'll always use this ceiling. All right. You guys have a, a good grasp on that, feel, feel confident? Question. Mm -hmm. So a high mins, would you you still add the 100 and the half mile? Yes. Yes. So with the high minimums, Captain, and that's a good question. With the high minimums, Captain, all we do, if we have the full ILS, everything's working, we'll just add 100 to this. So that gives us our 300 feet. Okay. And then we'll add the half mile to this, which gives us one mile. So 301. Let's say, the, what, the, uh, what was that? 500, 500 and one and one eighth. For this? Or, yes. Yeah, so for this, um, yeah, it'd be exactly. So. It would be the 501 and 1 8th, but, and this is something I forgot to, to say, but I think we went over it last class. If you see anything that is an 8th, you'll even see it 1 and 16th. We always round up to the next quarter. So 5 8 becomes 3 quarters. Um, so 1 and 1 8th would become 1 and a half. 
or I mean one and a quarter. So does that make sense? Yep. Be and that's that's simply because our weather reports are only published in quarter miles. So you'll always have like a one and one quarter, one and one half, one and one, uh, one and three quarters, but you'll never have anything in a lower fraction. So if we're calling out that 400 and five eighths, we're actually calling out 403 quarters. Yep, 403 quarters. Got it. And, and really, like, at the end of the day, if you say 400 and 5 eighths, it's really nothing wrong with that. As long as you can determine or you realize that when you're looking at a METAR and you're trying to figure out, am I legal to go, a METAR or a TAF, and you're trying to figure out, am I legal to go, and you just see halves or quarters, like, quarter or three quarter, whatever, that you know you have to round up to that next higher quarter, right? That's that's what's important. You can't look at it and be like, oh, that's, you know, five eighths, but I've only got a half mile, so we're good. No, we need to round up. Penalize. Always penalize. So, um, yeah, so high mins, we just add the hundred and a half K. Now I'm going to add something to it. If we are trying to determine whether or not, um, so so we determined that we looked at our weather at the destination and we determined that we require an alternate, okay? At that point, in order to get our alternate minimums, not our landing minimums, our alternate minimums, we need to come back into these charts, these Jeppesen charts, and we need to figure out um, what our alternate minimums are. Now, do you guys remember the one nav aid, two nav aid rule? Did anybody write that down? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're first, the first thing that I always do is I always go with the one nav aid rule. Okay. The one nav aid rule, and I need everybody to memorize this. The one nav aid rule states that if you have one ground based navigational approach, then you require, or it requires you add 400 feet to the ceiling and one mile to the visibility. Sorry. Yeah. So 401. Can you repeat the whole thing? Yeah. So, the, the one nav aid rule states that if there is only one, na uh, one ground-based navigational aid approach, you add 400 feet to the ceiling and one mile to the visibility for your landing minimums.
I actually found in my notes where it says one nav aid, two nav aid rule, but there was no definition following it whatsoever. Okay. So, so we need the definition now. So that's why I'm going over it again because <laughs> this is something that people mess up all the time still. You know, seasoned dispatchers will still get it wrong. Pilots call in all the time, and they're like, um, "What's the what's the one nav aid, two nav aid rule?" With? I I can't remember. You know. So can you put that into practical application with an example? Yeah. So with the one nav aid rule. Yes. Yeah, we'll we'll do that in just a second. I just want to make sure that everybody has. Has it written down? Does everybody have it? the first half of it again yep so if there is one ground okay so we're talking one nav aid rule here if there is one ground base navigational aid approach so you have to use a ground base nav right talking about a VOR localizer DME whatever the approach is using it has to be ground-based. You can't be using satellites here. So if you are using one NAVAID ground-based approach, then it requires that you add 400 feet to the ceiling and one mile to the visibility. my notebook on the break what was the second part so we're gonna add 400 feet to the ceiling and one mile to the visibility so if there's one ground-based navigational aid approach then it requires that you add 400 feet to the ceiling and one mile of visit one mile of visibility one mile to the visibility, yeah. Okay, so we're talking about one nav aid. Where does the two nav aid come in? All right, we'll get to that. Let's get the one nav aid knocked out here. So practical applications here. You can apply. Sorry, I don't mean to jump ahead. No, you're fine. You're fine. So you can apply the one nav aid rule to any airport as long as it is a ground-based nav, meaning no RNAV, no GPS. It has to be ILS, VOR, DME, LDA, any of those. Um, any anything that's using a, like a VOR or something, if it has a, a GPS, let me let me pull up what that looks like.
Oops. So you can see that it says RNAV GPS up here, but look how different like everything looks. Okay. If it says RNAV, GPS, anything like that, no bueno. Anyways, okay. So we've got one, we've got our nav aid here. This is obviously using ground based approaches, right? ILS. Okay. We can look in this identifier box here and see that it's IGPE, which stands for the ILS, and this is the identifier, GPE. Okay. This is the frequency that that localizer is using for this approach. So, what we do is we come down here to the landing minimums. And very much like what we did with the high men's captain, we need to add that 400 feet to this and one mile to this. So our landing minimums now become 600, one and a half. Okay. Everybody get that. Pretty simple, right? Okay. That being said, if we can get our landing minimums off of this. So we looked at the forecast. Our forecast said that we had three miles visibility and then we had a broken layer because remember we're, when we're talking ceilings, ceilings is our lowest layer of broken overcast or vertical visibility. So we've got three miles broken at zero, one, five. Zero, one, five. Remember what we do here? We just move the decimal point over three spaces every time. Or, no, I'm sorry, two spaces. So this becomes 1,500 feet. Sorry, it's two spaces. So. Yep. Okay, so like if you have three, zero, zero, that becomes 30,000 feet. I uh, have zero, zero, four, that becomes 400 feet. Everybody get it? Okay. So we have. I do get it. I'm. Garrett, I yeah. do get it. I'm just having a hard time of remembering when to add the zeros and when not to add the zeros. Yeah. So this is, we're talking weather reports here. So weather reports we'll get to, but, but yeah. So anyways, we get a broken report saying that the clouds are broken at 1800. We now require an alternate. Okay. And I'm looking and I look at Los Angeles and I look at this approach, this um, ILS into runway six right, and I see 200 and a half. Okay. If I apply the one nav aid rule and have one and a half miles visibility, 600 foot ceilings, 
do I need to go and try to figure out the two nav aid rule? Do I need to figure out anything else? Or am I legal to list that alternate at that point? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it would be legal because we have, this is telling us what the weather requirement is. So ceiling, we're talking yeah. about the, the, the weather, right? We're talking about that lowest layer of broken overcast or vertical visibility in the clouds. We got cloud. Oh, which was zero one five. So it was 1500. Yeah. So it was 1500. So we only need 600. So we're stopping about right here off. This is the runway here. We're stopping about 600. So we've still got a pretty good cushion. There. And then we scenario. can see three miles. So three miles, we only need one and a half. We're legal. Okay. Yes, we are legal to go. Yep. You okay. erased the 1500 reference. So yeah, my that's, mind. that's soft guard. Okay. Short term memory. You're good. My, my head's about to explode. <laughs> yeah. I understand. Okay. So if we can, we will always use the one nav aid rule because it's like so much less work. We can just got it, you know. Okay, for the two nav aid rule. And, and the same thing applies. So we need to make sure we need to check our notams and everything and make sure, you know, if the glide slopes out, we need to add those minimums to this and this. If the glide slopes out and the ALS is out, we need to add our minimums to this and this. You know, let's say the rail's out, but the ILS is good. Still, that box right there, okay? So we apply the minimums the same way, whether it's a high men's captain or a one nav aid alternate, okay? Now, if we have two navigational aid approaches, so instead of just one, we now have two different approaches that have, so we've got runway six right here, ILS runway six right, we also have ILS localizer runway seven left, okay? So we have two different approaches and looking at our frequency here and look, you're looking at the identifier, so IGPE, okay? So if we look at IGPE, and then we come down here, and we look at I, I, A, S. They're two different navigational aids, right? So when we say two nav aid rule, they have to be two different approaches into two different runways, okay? So it can't be the same runway, same approach. Two different runways, two different approaches, uh, two different navigational aids. Okay, so we look in that box first. That box, IGPE, that box, IIAS. You can even see the frequency is different, 111.1, 111.7, okay? So okay. it's using two separate navigational aids. So if we have two separate runways using two separate um, navigational aids, we can apply the two nav aid rule. So just like the other two things that we've gone over, instead of adding 400 this time, we only have to add 200 And we only have to add a half mile here. So that gives us 400 
and one mile, okay? So now if we have a weather report that says three miles visibility and 500 feet for our broken layer, okay? So three miles visibility, 500 foot broken. Can we use the one nav aid rule on that? No. No. Why? We're over a hundred. We're over a hundred feet. So so yeah so our minimums are six hundred and one and a half with the one nav aid rule. So if we have a layer at 500 feet, then we can't apply the one nav aid rule. It would still be illegal to list as an alternate. But if we apply the two nav aid rule, we have two separate approaches using two sep or two different runways using two different navigational aids, then we get 401, we're now legal because we have 400 foot ceilings, or our requirements 400 foot ceilings and one mile visibility. So we're legal. Okay. So next question, so does that mean, you're probably gonna get into this, I'm probably going ahead, but does that mean because this airport has two of them, we can go up to the two nav aid? Yeah. And yeah. some airports only have one nav aid, right? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I was understanding that. And there's even times when we have airports that have multiple different nav aids, like Los Angeles. We've got, what, like six different ILS approaches, maybe, maybe more. I think there's actually a total of like eight ILS approaches. But right now... You know, there's NOTAMs, I think there's NOTAMs for runway six, runway uh, six left, six right, runway eight, runway seven, and then like, they've got like six of the eight knocked out right now because they're doing construction. Um, I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but I know that there's several of the ILS out in LA right now. Um, point being is there's times when because of different things, we'll see a NOTAM that takes out our ILS and all of a sudden we're down to one ILS, you know, one, one, one single ground-based navigational approach, uh, one single ground-based navigational aid approach. And so we couldn't even apply the two nav aid rule then if we wanted to. So Garrett, these are applied to just our alternate minimums, right? So when we're only, getting yeah. an alternate. Okay. Perfect. So only alternates. This we will never ever 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 use this for our destination or for anything else. This is only if we're planning an alternate, a takeoff alternate or a first or a second alternate. That's it. So that being said, does everybody feel like they they kind of understand what I'm saying here? If you don't, please speak up. So my two uh, soon to ask for a practical application. Yeah. So well, no, you're you're not too soon. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So you know, I'm just gonna jump into Let me find some poor weather here. 
It's been such a good weather day. I don't think I'll be able to find anything. Um, okay. Oops. Oh, wait, TFRs. Dulles might be under one. Oh, no. Okay. So let's look at Norfolk. Okay, yeah, this is a good example. Okay, so we're looking at Norfolk. This is um, a good example. If our ETA was to fall right here at this 1200, okay, uh, would we require an alternate? So we're, we're planning on arriving here. So what's the one, two, three rule again? An hour before, an hour after ETA, 2,000 feet ceiling and three miles visibi visibility. Yep. Okay. So do we require an alternate if we're landing our ETA estimated time of arrival 1000 or one hour before one hour after we need 2000 foot ceilings and three miles visibility. Do we have that here in my blue highlighted line? Can everybody see it? It looks like you're overcast at 600 feet ceilings there, so no. Right. So with a 600-foot ceiling, we require an alternate because it's less than 2,000 feet. Okay. So I'm going to, just so that everybody is understanding this, so one hour before or after the ETA, right? So this line here, this is our little runway, okay? And this is our friendly little cloud here. Okay. When we are talking visibility, so let's say the three miles visibility, okay? We're talking about this distance here, okay? Is horizontal lateral distance okay so we need to be able to see things three statute miles in front of us whether we're below the clouds on top of the clouds well all of it's being taken below the clouds everything's being taken from the surface when we're when we talk visibility but we need to be able to see three miles laterally, okay? When we say 2,000 foot ceilings, we are talking vertical, okay? So we're talking from the surface to the bottom of this cloud layer. We need to have 2,000 feet. Oops, 2,000 feet, okay. So, remember, um, this is why memorizing what a ceiling is is so, 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 so important. Is because a ceiling we define as broken, lowest layer of broken, overcast, or vertical visibility. Okay. 
in a METAR, this is called a METAR, or in a METAR or a TAF. So this is a TAF, this thing right here. We're getting too crowded here. Okay, so this is our TAF. When we see OVC and then a number, that is our cloud layer. That's where the bottom of the cloud is. So when we see OVC, that means overcast. And I know we haven't gone over weather yet, but we see OVC and then we see 600 here. So 006, remember on a METAR or a TAF, whenever we're talking weather, we just have to add two zeros at the end. So 600 feet. So since we require an alternate right here, we would go and look at um, our charts. Okay. Now let's trying to think of an airport that's close to it's like I got to see a map to think of airports that are close but I don't want it to have don't want it to be a big one Um, here we go. All right, so let's see CRW. Let's say CRW. So we decide that CRW, we want to look at that airport for an alternate. Okay, you can see here, hopefully. Can everybody see this side here? Yeah. Okay, we have a localizer, ILS, and a VOR approach. Okay. Remember our cloud layer was 600 feet. I think I still have it up here. Yep, 600 feet, okay. So, let's look at the localizer approach real quick. Let's just see what this gives us. And let's apply the one nav aid rule. So what will our alternate minimums be applying the one nav aid rule? A thousand miles? Oh no, yeah. 800. Okay. 800. 802 miles. 802 miles. Okay. So would we be legal to list our alternate just going off that approach as this, this airport? No. Okay. So we'd go to the next approach here. Remember, ILS gives us our best landing minimums. And this is a very, very good example. Okay, what are our landing minimums? 701 and a half. 701 and a half. Okay. 
would we be legal to list this as our alternate? No. Just using the one nav aid rule. No, we would not. So, if we wanted to list this as our alternate, we would have to try to apply the two nav aid rule at that point. Correct? Everybody on, on board with me here? Yes. Okay. Yes. That being said, we can pull... So one of them has to at least be ground ground based. So we'll just pull the two ground base approaches here, and we'll look at them, and we'll determine what our minimums are. When we're doing this, you guys saw that we didn't have two ILSs, and the lowest ILS you can get, the lowest ILS you can get is two hundred and a half. That's the lowest category uh, category one. Um, ILS approach you can get. those. That's the bare minimum. Okay. This airport does not have those minimums. We had two non-standard minimums. So what we do with the nav aid, uh, two nav aid rule is we have to take the most restrictive Ceiling and the most restrictive visibility. Okay, mm -hmm. so looking at this chart here. So this is first the uh, the localizer approach. Okay, going down here, we had 373 and one mile. So 400 and one mile. Okay. Both of these were more restrictive than the ILS, right? ILS, we have 300 and a half. So our localizer is more restrictive in both categories, the ceiling and the biz. Okay. So that being said, we apply our two nav aid rule to these minimums only, so to our localizer minimums. So what are our minimums now? 600 and one and a half. And one and a half. 600 feet, one and one half mile visibility. Are we legal to list this as our alternate? Yes. 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 Because our weather is four statute miles visibility and 600 foot ceiling. So we are legal. So that was like, I couldn't have asked for a better example than that. <laughs> so Garrett, when you're doing these, do you have to physically open every single one of the approaches just to make sure you're getting the, the right one? Or do they kind of have like a summary as to what the most restrictive one is? When you're um, these out? Nope, just got to go clicking through. So that's why I like to apply the one nav aid rule first. And here's the other thing. So I know you guys, first of all, need to learn how to do it like this, super manual, super intensive, like in thought, right? You guys need to understand how to get these minimums. But when you are at an airline and you're looking at this, um, we have a box that we click and it says alt on here. It's like that, okay? It pulls up a box and it has your METARs on top so METARs, and then it has your TAFs, and then NOTAMs, and 
Rex, I don't know if you remember seeing this box. But then it has a separate box. You remember it? Yeah, several times. Yeah. We have to do it for every single flight. There's another box to the side here, and it lists alternates possibility. So it'll list a whole bunch of airports down here, and then right here it'll list how far they are from our destination. Okay. So what I, what every dispatcher does, not just me, but I'll look at my TAF here for my destination. It'll full, first pull up your destination here. Okay. I'll look at the TAFs for or the TAF for my destination, and I'll determine whether or not it needs an alternate. If it needs an alternate, I click the first alternate, it pulls up the METAR and TAFs for that first one. If the TAF is like, you know, six miles, sky's clear, or whatever, if I can see that without a shadow of a doubt, there is no way that it would be a wrong selection. I'll first click on that one, and then I just verify my notams, making sure that I have a ground-based approach really quick. And all I have to do to verify that I have that ground-based approach is pull up my chart viewer. I see that I have a localizer ILS and a VOR here. And then I would just compare that to my NOTAMs. And if my NOTAMs don't take any of those approaches out, then I know that I'm good. Okay. If it's questionable, like I'll actually drill into each one of my approaches and make sure. But if I see an ILS, I know that the lowest ILS is 200 and a half. And I know the most that I've seen for a straight in ILS, full functioning ILS is something like 400 and, and uh, like three quarter. So I know that if I'm like, if I've got sunny, clear days at the alternates that I'm selecting, and I'll just, if it's even close, and I've got another alternate that's just as far away. And on the other side, you know, on the same side of the weather as my destination. This is all super confusing because I'm trying to do it without actually showing you guys on a computer. But like on what we see at the at work, but um, basically at the end of the day, I will drill down until I find an easy easy alternate, like an easy choice. You also learn which ones are the big airports that have a lot of ILS or a lot of those real low minimum, you know, runways. And you try to use those and there's, there's some tricks that you kind of learn in the job, but you know, alternate selection takes all of what, 30 seconds Rex, if that. Yeah, I didn't even get a chance to read one of the charts when they were choosing and going through them because they're reading them so fast. Yeah. And it's the software really takes a lot of the thinking out of it. You have to be able to understand what the NOTAM says, and you have to be able to look at the weather and click. You got it, you know. Okay, Garrett, question? Uh-huh. Okay, in this on this chart on the left, you're showing runway runway five, which is um, the uh, opposite of runway two three. Mm -hmm. Each one of them has an uh, an ILS or a LOC. Um, so that just those two by themselves would create a two nav rule. Yeah. So we verify first. We verify first that we have two separate 
Yeah, Bates, do you see what I'm saying there? Yes. Let's pull it up here so it's so you've got ICRW and then you've got IHCV both using different frequencies. So and it's two even though it's the same piece of pavement, it's technically a separate runway. We consider it a separate runway. Okay. There's another thing to this, but we're not going to worry about it. I want you guys to get the how to get the alternate minimums down, and then we'll talk about the other thing. Don't feel like if you hear something, you know, from somebody at work or whatever, if you work at SkyWest, we're going to keep it at this until you guys have a good understanding of the one nav aid, two nav aid rule. And then we'll add the, the last thing on there. So, but I, I really feel like this is hard enough to get right now. So I don't want to like overload your brains too much, you know, too late. <laughs> <laughs> so does everybody feel like they can get their minimums? If I don't hear a no, that means yes. <coughs> okay. That being said, because I've completely overloaded your brains, I'll let you guys end the night with a movie. This is about air traffic control. We talked a little bit about air traffic control, but I want you guys to actually, like, get a good introduction to air traffic control. And then um, we actually have a lesson this week to finish off our navigation. If we go to our uh, course outline for week two, um, we'll finish off our navigation tomorrow. Um, and then we'll take the test We'll do a review tomorrow, and then we'll take the test on Wednesday. And then we'll jump into where we should be, week three. We'll talk about abnormal procedures, and then we'll get into systems here. Okay? We should be able to knock out systems a little quicker than what it shows here and catch up to where we need to be. But... Um, but yeah, I want you guys to have a good understanding of air traffic control. And then tomorrow we'll talk about some of the procedures and just kind of wrap up navigation tomorrow. And then we'll get into systems. Um, hopefully end of class Wednesday through Friday. So. And you said we'll be taking the test on Wednesday? Yes. Is everybody going to be here? I actually work on Wednesday. Uh, how would you like me to proceed? Are you going to be here for the review tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be here for the review tomorrow. Okay, I can send the test to you Wednesday. And then just at the same time as everybody else, would you have internet access while you're at work or no? I do. It's just a matter of if it's busy, that takes my priority. But if it's not busy, I can take it at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Just we'll, we'll work it out to where you just send it back to me when you complete it. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the air traffic control video. And here's the link. It's in the Google drive. I can post it in here too if you guys want to click on it real quick and get it queued up but it's about 50 minutes long you guys can watch part of it now part of it later 
whatever you guys want to. But uh, but it's pretty good video describing the life of an air traffic controller and and how communications transfer from from station to station. So. Yeah. Any questions? Nope. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Not for me, Garrett. Thank 